Okay, this is super weird. We're recording very late in the day. This is not right. Have you eaten supper? I, I did, but that's bad. I, I just, I'm just full of food now, and I'm going to fall asleep. It's like that uh, <laughs> episode of Seinfeld where Jerry's dad is working for Peterman. Right. And they're trying to get him fired, so they keep just scheduling these meetings late in the day because they know he's going to fall asleep. <laughs> so this may be the episode of the podcast where I fall asleep. Yeah. We, we had a planned power outage today at my house. But it was supposed to be done at 3 p.m., and guess what? It was not. Is that ironic? The clean energy show has I a think it's outage? a scandal is what it is. <laughs> they're, they're out to get us. They know that we're critical of uh, this utility. They're coming <laughs> after us by trying to shut us down. Uh, fortunately, thousands of, of other people have also been caught up in this. Yeah, so we're recording after 6 p.m., which is very weird for us. I'm very much a morning person, uh, but, you know, what can I say? I'll... I'll do my best, and I'm old now. I just turned 60, James. 60's too old, Brian. We need to replace you with something younger, like a two-year-old <laughs> AI chip or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's the sad truth. But yeah, I had a birthday, and I had a lovely party. You were able to come to my lovely party. I we would call a nice... it a gala, not a party. It was more of a... <laughs> it was a gala. <laughs> no, it was an intimate gathering at the Hotel Saskatchewan, our local fancy hotel, and I was able to invite James and, and some of our closest friends, and it was a lovely evening. It was uh, Regina's equivalent of the Met Gala, really. I mean, there was paparazzi <laughs> yeah. lining the streets when I was trying to get sure. in. It was tough. It was tough. But yeah, had a great time. We hired a band. I've never hired a band before for anything. But there's this local band called Last Birds, and they agreed to come and, and play at my birthday party. It was fantastic. It was so great, and their music is so great. Uh, we're going to have one of their songs at the end of the show. So if you're a music fan, uh, stick around for that. And I'm releasing a YouTube video today as well. Remember when I went to Columbus, Indiana, which we've talked about endlessly? Well, we shot a bunch of video while we were on the trip, and I cut it into a nice little three and a half minute video. And uh, that goes live on YouTube today, and I used a Last Birds song in that video. So it's it's kind of Last Birds week here on the podcast. You've uh, you bought out the band in all our respects then. That's something. <laughs> yeah. They're from a very unusual place. They're from a place, a small town. And not only yeah. are they from a very small town, they're from a small town in the middle of nowhere on the Canada-U.S. border in Saskatchewan and North Dakota. I think yeah. it's North Dakota. It's North Dakota, yeah. And it's yeah, where we cross right. into the United States typically, right, is North Portal. Not North South Portal, Portal but North <laughs> Portal, <laughs> because yeah. it's a portal into the other country. Yeah, and it's a town of 113 people that we we learned that at the show. Which is interesting. And then there's two of them are in a band. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're... they're um, not husband and wife, but they're partners, right? They're they're kind of uh, yeah. in a relationship yeah. together, and they uh, believe so, have yeah. acoustic um, songs. They were great at your party. And yes, I've never been to a party that had hired a band before. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it should be a new thing, Brian, and we should do this regularly. It'd be fun. Everyone had I'll a see what I can do. Everyone had a great time, but there was lots of talk that you may not have noticed between uh, my partner and your partner and, and uh, Spiro, your manservant and friend, um, about how they kind of have to walk on glass when recording the podcast and you can't break anything like your partner broke something <laughs> once a glass and can't vacuum <laughs> during the podcast. And, you know, they were commiserating about <laughs> what they have in common, these three people. And, and Spiro said, you can't make eye contact with Brian on podcast day. He goes off and does his work <laughs> and then comes back and it goes to the bomb shelter with a focus that you've never seen before. So that's true. That's, uh, it's true. I do. I do have to focus on this, and maybe you know, it's part of getting older. I got to focus kind of extra hard. Yeah. Well, it was fun. It was a fun party, and we'll hear that song at the end of the show. I myself am taking off on my only uh, trip that I know of this summer, and that is to go to uh, Calgary. That's a, usually a day long trip, and I'm taking my EV, which is not a Tesla. It's a Chevy Bolt EV, which means it charges slow doesn't have the longest range. It has decent range, but it's not what you would call a long range. So it makes it challenging, especially with lots of the non-Tesla chargers being 
down broken frequently and offline. So uh, the, the weather forecast for Thursday is my departure day and I'm only going to Brooks. I, I've heeded your advice of taking trips. The why, why do the whole thing? Why not stop early? So I'm doing that and we're going to uh, take in Dinosaur Provincial Park, which is near there, which is all apparently you just walk in this badland type you know, um, geography and just find dinosaur bones. It's possible that you sure. can actually find them. You just stumble across a T-Rex. Sure. That kind of thing. Well, it's happened before. It's happened recently even. So that's what we're going to do. But the weather's bad for Thursday. It, it's rainy and cool and there's a nasty headwind. So I'm nervous yeah. now. And I wanted to point out something about um, a better road planner. That is a app that us non-Tesla people use. Tesla people will use the app in their car to plan the routes and say, okay, you can go this far. It's taking data from your car, from your battery and the efficiency and speed you're going and, and the weather and terrain, you know, up and down terrain of the uh, different elevations that you're going through. And it will calculate that. Well, this does the same thing, but you have to pay for the premium version to get live weather data incorporated. So I compared the two before I resubscribed. I only subscribe when I'm going on a trip. I don't keep it year round. There's no point in it. But the first one, it said, okay, it's going to take from here to Brooks uh, an hour and 12 minutes and two charges. Okay. But when I incorporated it, when I uh, paid for it and got the live weather incorporated, which is windy today, so it's kind of a similar day, except actually quite warmer. So it'd be worse on Thursday, but because warm is good for electric cars for a couple of reasons. But it then says it goes from 112 minutes to 144 minutes, which is an extra half hour and an extra stop to charge. So it's a big difference. So my advice to you people out there who are using a better road planner, and I don't know that there's anything else really to use other than, you know, I could use the Chevy app, but I don't trust it. Um, it does pretty much the same thing, but I don't trust it. I will compare it if I can. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's worth getting the paid version. So what I'm doing is I'm hooking it up to a dongle that I bought for about $30 Canadian, $20 American. You stick it in the port that the mechanic sticks their doohickey in to read the car computer. And yeah, it just sends a Bluetooth, a low energy Bluetooth signal to your uh, phone. And um, yeah, you get live data. So it's very accurate and it takes away my range anxiety, which I will have greatly, um, you know, if, if it, shows me that I'm down to like 4% remaining of range, I will have to slow down on the highway and we will slow down until that gets up to, you know, six, seven, eight percent Yeah. And I feel like this chat is probably making a lot of people scared who are thinking about EVs, but these are unusual, very specific conditions for us. We're in the middle of nowhere. There aren't that many chargers, at least non-Tesla ones. We have crazy, insane wind you know, you have a car with slow charging. So, you know, don't let this turn you off of electric cars. We have a very specific, weird circumstance. Yeah. You know, if I had uh, what most cards do, it would be at least half the charging time. You know, it wouldn't be, yeah, which would equate the fastest I could stop, go pee and get a snack or a meal because we have to grab meals. So even if you're in a hurry, it, you know, it would be about what you would stop for anyway, and it wouldn't be any different. Even with today's next technology, and it's only getting faster and better. Um, yeah, and next year, when if I have to make this trip next year, which I probably will because my my partner's family's there, and it's all we do is we go there to see them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm getting kind of tired of it. But um, next year, I'll be, hopefully be able to use the Tesla network as a, as a security backup because uh, they'll, they'll, hopefully Chevy will send me a adapter for the... Um, because Tesla uses a different charge port, and soon all cars will have that charge port. Yeah, I think it should hopefully be better next year. Uh, okay, so from Bloomberg, Germany eliminates red tape for renewables. So this is a great article. It's a thing we often talk about on the show that one of the barriers to switching to clean energy is the difficulty in bringing new clean energy onto the grid. This is not a simple process and you have to allow for you know government permitting and sometimes environmental studies and all that kind of thing and and you know i've always thought of it as more simple than this i think like it just uh, you know in some jurisdictions have sped up the process of approving uh, renewables um but i don't know enough about it to really know what it is you have to do so in my mind i was just thinking well they don't they just have to hire more people for the 
permitting department or something? Like, isn't that how it works? But no, it's more complicated than that. So um, Germany in particular has been trying to switch as fast as possible to renewables, which, which we've discussed many times because they're trying to wean themselves off of natural gas from Russia. Germany has been uh, one of the hardest hit for this. So there's a real urgency. Um, they've used a lot of liquefied natural gas imported as a stopgap, but uh, you know, they want to get more renewables. So as the article says here, the time it took to get permits had doubled since 2017 before these new reforms. So in Germany, securing approvals for one 2022 project to erect three wind turbines required 36,000 pages of documentation printed what? out and what? handed to authorities. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could so, do an organ transplant for less than that. I mean, I, I don't get it. But I could see how it happens, right? I like mean, how many I papers in... would it take to get a nuclear reactor going? Yeah, I couldn't imagine even that being 36,000. It's hard to imagine, but our equivalent, James and I have been involved in the film and television industry, and a lot of it is government funded. And so I have some kind of sense of how this happens, right? Like it's just bureaucracy gets piled on top of bureaucracy. And and yeah, if you get funding for a movie, you got to end up, it's not quite 36,000 pages, but you have to lot of, file a lot of paperwork because the government has to cover their ass and make sure that, you know, everything's above board since they're handing out money to a bunch of flaky artists right. like you and me. So uh, since then, since 2022, Germany has reduced the red tape drastically, according to interviews. In just over two years, the country is now deploying more renewables than any other European peer. So how did that happen? The government attacked the problem in a systematic way and anchored the solutions in legislation. It's not just about hiring more people in the permitting department. One law designated clean energy projects an overriding public interest that serves national security. We've talked about that many times. Energy security is important. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, if you're always having to rely on importing your energy, that's not good for your national security. Another required German states to allocate about 2% of their land for wind turbines. Further amendments cut the number of environmental assessments required to just one and simplified the previous double-tracked grid planning process by removing an entire agency's involvement. So this is not the same as a nuclear power plant. That's a big, dangerous, possible thing. It's also the renewables, opposite of Alberta next door, which is making yeah, it harder in, for, making it harder. for renewables. But we know by now that putting up a solar farm, putting up wind turbines, it's not a super dangerous kind of thing. So it says here, we save two to three years for new transmission corridors, said Chief Executive Officer of Transmission for the grid operator Transnet BW. It's definitely a significant improvement. Germany aims to get 80% of its electricity from renewables by 2030, which is uh, coming up faster than you might think. I think it's at uh, least so, eight years in North America, if not longer, for transmission. So yeah. that's that's a huge difference when you're trying to uh, deploy a grid and, and get renewables on it. And something else we've talked about on the show, Germany's parliament also recently made it easier for people to deploy solar on their balconies and harder for landlords to object to the installations. So that's a big thing. You know, balcony solar is huge in Germany, as we've talked about on the show. And Berlin has offered subsidies for these plug and go panels. They've already received 10,000 applications just in uh, April. So um, it goes on. There's still problems to be solved now that projects have received land permits. The challenge for wind companies is getting permission to transport the enormous turbine blades. That can still take months to secure in Germany. And uh, other European countries can make them available within days or weeks. So they've done huge reforms to part of it. But for whatever reason, you know, the transport permits for these giant wind turbines is still a stumbling block. So when they transport wind tur turbine blades, they they take up, there's like on one semi truck and then a trailer like, I don't know, a block back. Half a mile down the yeah, road. Yeah, a long <laughs> way back. And it's not about, I wouldn't think it would be about, you know, sometimes when you, you transport a pre-built home or something down the highway, you have to lift power lines or actually disconnect them uh, or at least supervise them. But in this case, it's probably going around you know, bends and, and blocking off traffic and, um, you know, maybe taking up yeah. oncoming lanes when you're turning or something. I don't know. I honestly don't know, but it's interesting. I would yeah, like and to know. 
you and I have both seen them on the highway, and it is a pretty ridiculous operation. And, and they're getting bigger. They're getting bigger, but way easier around here where we live because we have these large, vast expanses of, uh, you know, where there's not much going on. But you can imagine the German roads might be more difficult. So anyway, they haven't solved that problem of the transport permits, but... Uh, overall, Germany has really done huge reforms to speed up this process, and getting rid of red tape is a huge, way bigger problem, way bigger part of the clean energy solution than I think most people realize. And I think Australia did a good job of getting rid of red tape for solar, and that's why solar took off, because it's a yeah. soft cost, and it's hard to invest in things when you don't know, you know how long the delays are going to be, because delays can mean lost profits and you could lose money on a project. So yeah, it makes a big deal for that. Uh, Brian, Canada has matched the United States in putting a 100% tariff on Chinese cars. Why is that important? Because China is exporting high quality and very cheap electric cars, and we need cheap electric cars. You know who's not making cheap electric cars? The OEMs. They're they're putting out cars, they're they're not matching China's price, and furthermore, they're losing thousands of dollars on each of them. It's incredible, Some in some cases. Yeah. So amid industry pressure to copy the U.S. program, Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, said 100% surtax will be levied on all Chinese-made EVs on October 1st. The tariff would effectively double the price of imported vehicles, which is not what you want to do. Uh, as it expected, most of the tax would be passed on to you and me, the consumer, the person who might want to buy an affordable uh, electric car. I probably would. If I had an option, I would, you know, I would. An electric car is expensive for me. It's expensive for everyone if you want to get into it. And they're making better ones. So the new tariff will apply to those Shanghai-made Teslas like your Model Y, Brian. You, your Model Y, since you live in Canada, you had it made in China. No, mine came from California. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. I thought all of them, Model 3s and Model Ys, were, were coming from no, China. No, I think it's been maybe just the shorter range Model 3s have been coming from China, and sometimes the, the shorter range Model Ys. Oh, because you no, bought a came... long range, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're making the LFP model um, Teslas in China and exporting them to Canada. So, yeah, the uh, development is that... Well, it's a different kind of battery. It's lower density and it's also cheaper, but you wanted longer range because we live in a very cold climate. You wanted to make sure those winter trips can happen without problems. So um, yeah, they're expected to force the uh, the US automaker to um, supply the Canadian market with vehicles made at what other, other plants. I don't think it'd be a big deal, although they're gonna probably not make as much profit on them. And maybe the prices of those cars will go up, which is not what we wanna see. Yeah, and there were updates recently on the European tariffs. So the Europeans also put uh, import tariffs on Chinese-made EVs, but they're far less, and they did some adjustments recently. And the justification when Canada or the U.S. or Europe puts tariffs on Chinese-made EVs, they say that there's unfair subsidies that the Chinese government is basically you know, putting you know half the money into these cars and then just sort of dumping them at cheap prices. That remains to be seen. The European Union did an investigation. I don't know how they do that, but they have adjusted the tariffs in Europe. So the ones for the Chinese made Teslas came down a bit. I think the BYD tariff came down a bit. Other manufacturers, they kind of stayed the same or, or went up a bit, but they're more in like the 10%, 20% range than this uh, crazy 100% that we have here in Canada and the US. I'll have the details of that in just a moment, but why not put tariffs on TVs then? You know, if you're the uh, minister for, I think, finance came out in Canada and said, there's bad labor practices in China and bad environmental policies. Well, I can't find a lot of information on that. Um, not credible information, so I don't know where they're getting it from, but I, it's not that I completely doubt that, but I'm, everything we buy is from China. Your iPhone's from China, your laptop's from China. Everything we buy is from China. The camera that's shooting the show is from China. Everything's made in China now. Uh, there's furniture made in China. You get, this bottle of water is probably made in China. Like... Why would we attack something that is so important for, to transition away from fossil fuels? Well, I believe the answer is they're protecting the automakers that are here 
in North America because, as you just they said, screwed they up, haven't right? figured out. They screwed yeah. up. <laughs> they didn't get on the horse and get on EVs when they should have. And now they're way behind. And I don't have any faith that they'll even catch up in 10 years. Well, you remember not too many years ago, the U.S. automakers were went bankrupt and were bailed out. So this is really, it's like a preemptive bailout. They're, they're trying to stop them from going bankrupt, I think, before it happens. And because, yeah, if the Chinese EVs came in, they would probably make no it. mistake about it. They would yeah. go bankrupt within a number of years. I don't know if it would be five, eight, 10, 12 years. It wouldn't take long. Because at what point, at what amount of your sales do you have to lose before these companies go bankrupt? It's not the whole thing before they go. It's a, it's a tiny fraction of it. And then they're done. So this tweet is from uh, Nate Wallace of the Enviro Defense Fund. Uh, we support the idea of establishing a level playing field. In other words, yes, put tariffs on China if they are subsidizing. But setting tariffs at 100% without any investigation or evidence is not about leveling the playing field. It's about shutting out competition entirely. So incumbents, the idiot incumbents, can keep the prices of EVs high and keep selling gas cars instead. Clean Energy Canada, not to be associated with this show. This is an organization that uh, lobbies for clean energy investment. Unfortunately, Canada made a decision today that will result in fewer affordable electric vehicles for Canadians, less competition, and more climate pollution. To be clear, Canada could have applied a reasonable tariff that considered multiple interests. Europe, for example, is applying tariffs that range from 36% from on cars from SAIC Motor to 17% on BYD to 9% on Chinese-made Teslas. Wow. So she criticized them for working condition and environmental policies. Their investigation in Europe found that's not so much. Can you imagine buying a BYD with 17% uh, tariff raised on it, it would be cheaper than every other car. Not a lot cheaper, but, you know, because they, they sell them for half as much in China, but they don't sell them for that much overseas, not just because of tariffs, but for other reasons. But it would be significantly cheaper, and Tesla would not be able to compete with that even, let alone um, other car makers. And they have a lot of models. And if you're not into an EV, they've got plenty of uh, plug-in electric hybrids, which have a range, like they act as an EV and then a gas uh, engine comes on after, say, 100 kilometers. Yeah, their plug-in hybrids have gotten a much larger range, apparently, in the last year or two. So, like, yeah, really usable range of 100 kilometers. And something. they're very popular, but I would not want to have to go get an oil change, because even if you don't use your engine on those things, you got to go get the oil change. I never want to get another oil change, Brian. There are certain things that I've yeah. put behind me in life. <laughs> that is one of them. So Ford and GM greatly set back their EV ambitions shortly after the U.S. government announced this 100% tariff on Chinese EVs. This happened in the United States a few months ago. And then what happens? Well, pressure's off. I guess we can set back our EV ambitions. So, you know, you need to figure out what the subsidies um, of the Chinese government are. You need to address those. 100% is not anywhere near fair. Maybe it's a negotiating tactic because they know that they'll come back um, with higher things. So BYD, by the way, that's a Chinese... Uh, automaker. It's set to become the largest automaker in the world by 2030. It has already surpassed Honda and Nissan to become the world's seventh largest automaker, recording 40% growth in sales in the second quarter of 2024. Ford, Ford is going to be surpassed by them shortly. In August, after the announcement in the United States, Ford was casting plans for an all-electric three-row SUV and delaying the launch of a full-size EV pickup. The automaker said it will instead prioritize the introduction of new all-electric commercial van in 2026, followed by a more affordable mid-sized EV pickup and a full-size pickup by 2027, a delay of about 18 months. You can't delay things by 18 months. The Chinese, yeah. they're, they're right behind us on the horizon. They're marching in and you're screwing around. Uh, GM, again, showing his plans for all electric vehicles by delayed further by a second U.S. electric truck plant is delayed and the Buick brand's first EV is delayed. A uh, company will not achieve its prior target of having North American production capacity of 1 million EVs by 2025, nowhere near that. GM did not update the timing on anything. So I say patooey to them. It's a big mistake. It's wrong. 
you got to have a compromise. I, you know what? The uh, the workers are going to suffer, but it's the fault of the people they work for. You, no one's protecting Nokia and Kodak when they were supplanted by newer, better, cheaper technology because you know they didn't get off their butts and and pursue that. So why should we protect the auto workers? I know it's a huge part of our economy. I know that. Uh, politically, it's certainly important, both in Canada and especially the United States and Michigan and so forth. I don't know. And psychologically, it's huge. You know, uh, America is in many ways, thinks of themselves as synonymous with the automotive industry. And to have them go bankrupt a second time would be difficult for their psyche. I, I think that's what's going on. It's a slow burn, but something's got to improve. It's time to dip into the mailbag, would you? All right, so we got a message from Bob. Hi, guys. Just to follow up to my solar install with the Wiser meter. So Bob told us about this a while ago. This is a device you can add to your home, add to your Wi-Fi network, and there's an app, and it allows you to monitor electricity usage in your house, including solar panels if you have that. And it sounds really interesting because it's not that complicated. Um, you know, you could get a smart panel where every breaker in your house is connected to Wi-Fi, but those are sort of complicated and expensive. This does it in a sort of a cheaper, easier way, um, although you kind of have to teach the system. The system has to learn what your devices are uh, over time. So uh, Bob goes on, really enjoying the live data on power generation and usage. It really helps to learn about your power usage. The Wiser Meter definitely takes time to learn your devices and makes mistakes along the way. I have found their support to be great. And he sent us an image here of uh, solar production and power usage on a graph that he gets uh, on the app. Uh, but yeah, so that's the, the sticking block is that you have to spend some time teaching it what all your different devices are, but, um, you know, way simpler and cheaper than a, than a big, you know, smart meter panel or something. You pretty much have to be retired to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so would you do it? You, were you thinking about this? Is this something that I'm might definitely come up? interesting. Yeah, I'm interested because I would love to have more data about, you know, the power usage. And I know you have like a power meter or something, so you, you can plug it into individual devices in your home. I've got a smart plug much... that uses Wi-Fi, yeah. and one, two of those I have, one turns on the subwoofer, for example, but it's just <laughs> just because that's what I needed it for at the time, and that's what it still does, but oh, yeah. it, it does give you power use. So I, I did sort of make a sort of like a Excel page of all the different things that use power in my house. And it was very educational. I recommend people yeah. do it. There's a thing you can buy on Amazon too. What's that called? I can't remember. It's like a power something. I forget. Darn it, I forget. But you can buy a device to measure power of, you know, you plug, say you have a fan, you plug the fan into this device, then you plug this device into the wall, and then it tells you how much power you've used. So yeah. I did that. And Very the, interesting. The, the device that always gets me, and I think that most people don't know about, is cable boxes, like cable PDR yes. boxes. Most people don't realize. They don't shut they off. Don't, they use an insane amount of power. You're paying five or 10 bucks a month on your bill just to power your cable box. I usually. know it's terrible. It's terrible. And they should do better. Um, you know, my hard drive is always spinning. And yeah, you know, if, you, if I, I could put a smart plug on that sucker and just completely power it down because I'm not recording anything in the middle of the night anyway. So if you look at everything they records in the middle of the night, um, <laughs> there's not much there. But if you did, that you'd be screwed. But you could turn it off that way and at least save a few hours of it at night, but then it would have to reboot in the morning, and that's a process that lasts a few minutes. Um, yeah, I don't know. They should put like an SSD, one of those solid-state hard drives in those things to use less power because you can feel the heat coming off. Them. If, whenever yeah. there's heat, there's power usage because that is a draw. Yeah. Anyway, we'd love to hear from our listeners. Contact us by email, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And thank you for that. Um, I have some research, Bob. Thanks for that, Bob. But I have some research um, from the uh, university in Qatar. It is uh, printed in PV Magazine, did an article about this. So they have investigated the potential of bifacial east-west oriented vertical solar panels. We've talked about this on the show. Interesting idea. 
solar panels that are bifacial pick up solar on both sides. Putting them vertical and facing them east-west means you get sun in the morning and in the afternoon and a lot flatter during the midday where it's usually the peak. Yeah, solar creates a huge peak during the middle of the day, but that east-west orientation would eliminate the peak on those particular panels. And levels it out for more of a base load, at least during the daylight hours. And they found that in the desert, in soiling conditions in the desert, see, in the desert, panels that sort of lay flat are the optimal level for the sun, especially in southern deserts, it's practically flat because you're closer to the equator you get, the optimal uh, angle is uh, fairly flat, so you get a lot of dust collected on them. And they have found that these systems, um, because they don't get dusty, are like 9.2% higher power generation compared to conventional arrays. The test showed that over about three years, tilted modules had soiling losses up to 60%. They do clean them, but if you don't, you get a loss of up to 60% for monofacial modules, which is one-sided panels and 45% for bifacial modules and uh, the vertical modules experienced negligible soiling losses. So this is one of those weird things when you're making lots of solar different parts of the world, they're experimenting with different things. I always find that stuff interesting. Yeah, and sometimes there's robots that clean the panels. There's there's I love different... me a robot, Brian, especially a cleaning yeah. <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, do you have a robot vacuum in your house? Uh, good question. Uh, yes. I have one in my house. I do not use it. Um, I find that you have to keep the house fairly clean to use it. <laughs> right, you can't. Or it will choke on to death floor. on something. <laughs> no, we we <laughs> you know we had it just before we had kids, and then they became toddlers. Right, the babies turned into toddlers. Then there's Lego everywhere, and a Lego will kill the robot vacuum, and you know everything else that you could imagine. So yeah, we stopped using. it. I did buy another battery for it recently, but we still found that. Uh, you know, it was one of those early first generations. I paid a hundred bucks for it and it was refurbished and yeah, I love the thing. It's got a personality, but you still have to do a lot of maintenance so on them. Lego is deadly for robot and uh, robot vacuums and parents. And parents. And I'm vacuums. still like, I don't know why. I don't know why there's Lego in this house, but my wife is going through stuff and <laughs> finding Lego and then spilling it occasionally. And I still step on it after all these years. My kids are adults. That shouldn't happen anymore. I should be past that. Anyway. All right. So moving on, this is a story from Hydrogen Insight, a ship that creates hydrogen while transporting it. So I love to cover these kinds of stories that are futuristic, out of the box thinking, something nobody else has thought about. It's very original. It's very unique. And then I explain it, and then you uh, say that it's stupid and, and crazy okay. and ridiculous. Let's, and let's get work. started then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So these are ships that can generate hydrogen at sea. That's stupid. And there's a startup that has uh, got some funding for this. It's a vessel designed to seek the Goldilocks wind patterns and will fill removable tanks with green hydrogen. So the idea being that these are... Uh, it's, uh, well, what does it say here? So there's a UK-based startup, Drift Energy. They've got $6 million in venture capital funding for the deployment of their first 60-meter-long catamaran with an onboard one-megawatt electrolyzer powered by underwater turbines. The firm says the vessel can produce up to four tons of hydrogen on one trip, which would then be shipped to shore for use on land. So uh, they said the company is searching for more funding to begin building the vessel in about a year to 18 months with a plan to get the first demonstration on the water within three years. So um, they've designed the vessels along with a routing algorithm able to find locations with the best wind conditions. We send them out fishing. We're looking for Goldilocks wind speeds to generate electricity and hydrogen with. He said the North Atlantic trade winds were an optimal location for these vessels to be deployed, but also suggested the Caribbean, where more frequent hurricanes could be harnessed by these ships before they have to flee the worst of the weather. Yeah. On their return, the ships could help restore energy, uh, you know, if there's blackouts caused by uh, the hurricanes. So they say that these uh, turbines and their sort of vertical, stiff wind kind of sails that they can outperform land-based wind turbines by 40% and offshore wind turbines by 30%. So this is solid wing technology. Okay, so these it's are autonomous developed. little catamarans with 
hard sails on them, four hard sails sticking up. There's a turbine yeah. under the water, so the wind on the surface pushes this thing around, and the water yeah. pushes the turbine under the water, which creates electricity, which can then make hydrogen. Yeah, so they say that these sail developments sort of came from the America's Cup. Like, there's been advancements in sailboat oh, technology sure. in the last few years. And it has, you know, allowed, you know, these racing ships to sail many times faster than the prevailing winds. So, uh, yeah, it um, will have these ISO container tanks. So it'll, uh, you know, travel around the ocean. I mean, you could theoretically even deliver them right like say you instead of creating some hydrogen and shipping it somewhere you could just create the hydrogen while you're shipping it and these are standard shipping containers that can be unloaded at at uh different ports so you know that's the that's the crazy idea a lot of people get excited about crazy ideas in the clean energy world and yeah i used to be one of them and then i became more cautious about stuff like this. Uh, we'll never hear from this again, ever. I don't think so. I don't think so. It's just too weird. It's uh, it, it would take a lot of investment and mm. maybe it would work. Maybe it's, maybe it capsizes. You, you know, you just go, go hunting hurricanes and then take off when the going gets tough. I, I, I don't know. Like, uh, well, I don't know. And, it said, and, and there's not yeah. always a hurricane. The amount of hurricane time <laughs> is uh, a tiny fraction of the year. You can't, why would you why even mention that? You can't go chasing and hurricanes. It said they, they explored doing it with just batteries. You could send these out to just charge a bunch of batteries, but they felt that the energy density of the batteries wasn't enough to make it worthwhile. And apparently the energy density of hydrogen, you know, they say does make it worthwhile. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> I think it's uh, it's interesting when people dream of these ideas because it's it's pretty cool and they're thinking uh, differently about ways that can be done. But I don't know. We'll see. I would love to see a prototype work. Then I'd get more excited. But we'll see. For this is from Yale Environment now. China appears to be tapping the brakes on coal. We're always hearing about how China burns a lot of coal, how they're making a lot of coal plants still because their need for energy has been expanding so rapidly that they've thrown everything at it. Nuclear power plants, by the dozen, everything. Uh, so China appears to be tapping the brakes though on coal now. The amount of new coal power approved in the first half of this year is down a whopping 80% from the same period last year. Officials have been looking to coal to meet demand for when solar and wind are in short supply. Over the last two years, China has permitted 197 gigawatts of new coal capacity, which is a lot. It's pretty much 197 nuclear power plants. So, or the reactors, rather, the plants, there would be two of them. So half that, 100 plants, 100, you know, 200 reactors. So the uh, power through the sector may now be at a turning point, analysts are saying, and coal is on its way out. One question remains, though. Are Chinese provinces slowing down the coal approvals because they're already approved? So many coal projects asked one project lead for Greenpeace, East Asia, or are the last gaps of coal in an energy transition happening? And uh, be because it's increasingly impractical, only time can tell, he says. It is now time for... The Lightning Round. The Lightning Round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. Tesla's favorability with liberals slash Democrats dropped from 39% to 16% in six months, Brian. Six months. 39 to 16. That's bad. Also dropped among conservatives slash Republicans. Meanwhile, in Great Britain, a national survey found that 33% of people are less likely to buy a Tesla because of Elon Musk. Lawsuit. Yeah, so we often talk on the show about if your government or your utility is not doing enough to shift to clean energy. One of my favorite things is a lawsuit. There's one going on around here. Sometimes these things are successful. Sometimes they're not. There's currently a shareholder lawsuit. A 
Tesla shareholders have gotten together to sue Musk for not uh, doing his fiduciary duty. As a CEO, you have a fiduciary duty to do the best thing for your shareholders. And as we know, he, he often doesn't do that. So um, there's a lawsuit happening now. And uh, yeah, I just like that because, you know, we could fill every episode every week talking about Musk and it's just adding to the noise. And uh, but a lawsuit is a direct action that, you know, maybe be successful, maybe not. But, but if people are turned um, off by it, I mean, this affects Tesla investors as well. And, you know, I, I'm not very happy. I'm not don't have a rosy outlook for Tesla right now. It doesn't seem, you know, to give me much optimism. Unless you unless you're absolutely think that the software for self-driving is going to happen, which a lot of people do. I I'm among the doubtful. They still had record revenue in the most recent quarter, so it's it's not like, you know, the fundamentals haven't uh, materially changed. It's still a good company, but, uh, you know, it's just frustrating and annoying. Because they have lower demand for EVs, they've got more batteries available for power walls and things for battery backup systems for homes and businesses and for the grid. So, you know, that's taking off. So that's doing quite well, apparently. New record in July this year, Germany broke a new record. 20%, 27% of all electricity generation was from solar more than ever before in one month. So that's good. And people around here say not even possible. And yet we have better solar here than Germany, for example. A new Berkeley lab report on US wind 2023 unsubsidized levelized wind cost was $49 per megawatt hour, $49 per unit. But get this, the health and climate benefits were 162 megawatt dollars per megawatt hour equivalent. And the grid system benefits $21 per megawatt hour. And total benefits are 183 of a benefit of health and climate and grid benefits. And it's only actually $50 or less to... Uh, to pay for that wind on the grid. Yeah, lots of benefits to going to clean energy. Uh, yeah. Turkey's largest solar manufacturer, Ankara, something we hear a lot about on the show, that company, their um, Ankara Solar recently came out with a line of walkable solar panels, which have a durable, these are flooring for outdoors, outdoors or indoors, uh, is it like a sandwich board you can put advertising on? No, this is walkable. This is like instead of a, like a large stone slab on your patio, you would have a patio of solar panels that you could walk on. And they have a durable non-slip glass surface that can be installed in floors indoors and open areas outdoors. So, you know, if you run out of um, roof space for solar like I did, well, maybe I would have a large patio uh, and then get solar that way. Although... Yeah, we snows here in the winter, so I don't know. Maybe not the yeah. best here, but there's a lot of places in the world where that would work. And uh, what also, it also looks pretty cool. I think I just saw a visualization of it, not the actual thing, a rendering. Um, yeah, patio, if not enough room on your roof. China's Xpeng Motors, uh, their new mono line of AI-centric EVs, is similar to Tesla's Model 3, but half the price in China. This is a new model that they've come out with that is similar to the Model 3, but half the price of the Model 3 in China. It's time now for a CES a Fast Fact. <laughs> Top wind generating states in the United States as of a percentage of all electricity generation last year. Buckle in. This is, this is shocking. Iowa, 76% plus. 76% of their generation of electricity came from wind. Wow. South Dakota, one of the redder states in the union, almost 70%. Kansas, 66%. North Dakota, we know North Dakota. It's by North Portal, where to this week's musicians come from. And it's at over half, 55% pretty much. Wyoming, now there's the reddest state in the union. I've been there, it's awfully red. 53% just under. Uh, Oklahoma, 51%, 52% close to that. New Mexico, 50%. That is a lot of renewables just from one type of renewable in those states. So, yeah, that didn't happen because of altruistic reasons. That happened because of economic reasons, the theme of our podcast. Another fact, the average 
capacity factor for U.S. wind built in 2022 was 38.2%. If you want to know what capacity factor is, listen to last week's show. It was all about capacity factor. That's up from 5% from turbines built in 1998 to 2022 on average. So yeah, wind turbines getting better. The same turbines, you put up six turbines, it's going to give you that much more uh, energy than the old ones did. Yeah, from 33% now to 38 in just a, just a few years. So yeah, when it comes time to replace those in 25, 30 years, you actually replace them with better ones. So yeah, the same wind farm, the same footprint gives you more electricities as you do replace those. Uh, they're also getting somewhat taller onshore, as you know. Germany has added 7.5 gigawatts of solar PV in the first half of 2024. And that's up from um, just over 6 gigawatts last year from the same half of the year. Uh, that's a lot. There's a lot of solar in Germany. And again, Germany, not the best place for solar yet. They're forging ahead and it's working out. Uh, how is Norway's EV transition affecting gas stations? This is a question I've had for a long time. What will happen to gas stations? Norway, huge, of course, in the EV transition. Well over 95% of new cars are electric. They still have some, a lot of gas cars still on the road, of course. Well, gas stations from 1970 to 2000 actually declined a lot because uh, actually 50%, by 50%, there was twice as many in uh, 1970 as there was in 2000. I wonder if that's similar here because cars are more efficient. They go further on the same tank. They have to fill up less. When we get longer range EVs, we'll need less charging stations, assumably, and, you know, 10 years from now as things go on. Uh, property has become more expensive, so they've, you know, it's not as economical to put up as much gas, as many gas stations. And other grocers, because uh, gas stations sell groceries and convenience products, they're extending their opening hours, so you wouldn't have to go to a gas station, so it's less profitable for that. But in the last decade, since EVs have taken over there, there's been no change. The decline of gas stations has actually been saved by EVs because that means you can just install chargers, you carry on selling hot dogs and hoagies and whatever it is gas stations sell. Here it's cigarettes yeah. and lottery tickets. Yeah, but in a lot of places, Norway... Especially, there's chargers everywhere, and a lot of them now at gas stations. Why not have both? And finally this week, China's third plenum, an important five-yearly meeting traditionally associated with major economic reforms, concluded on the 18th of July in Beijing. This is a big deal. New policy gets hashed out for China, and that sort of ripples around the world. It urges officials to make concerted efforts to cut carbon emissions and actively respond to climate change. This, Brian Stockton, is the first time carbon emissions have been mentioned in a plenum document. I know way more about China than I used to, and way more than I should, but I guess we all should, because China's a big deal now, and it's becoming a bigger deal by day, and it certainly affects the future of the world. It is a big deal, says Bill Bishop, author of the Cynicism newsletter. He told Bloomberg, as uh, G putting a stamp quote unquote, on the idea will send a powerful signal to stakeholders across the system. And that is it for this practically live show this week as we rush and I get going on vacation. Yes, we got to get this done before my batteries die. So you can contact us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com and uh, around social media, we're clean energy pod and we're going to end the show with some music this week so this is last birds thanks to them so much for uh, playing amazing music at my birthday party and for letting me put their music on uh, my youtube video that goes live today on the brian stockton uh, youtube channel so look at that if you're interested in the columbus indiana and uh, the last birds you can find them at lastbirds.com please check them out they're amazing and i guess we'll see you next week
Stop. 